Welcome to part two of the Battlefield Walk and Talk on Little Round Top, July 3rd, 1863 with Mike Lentz, where he'll be talking about troops from New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Texas. This is a social trail. What we're talking about with social trails are trails that aren't exactly put here by the park service, but people have kind of etched in over time. And uh, so this is kind of more what they're talking about when trying to prevent like social trails or trying to make the social trails a little bit more uniform and make them into official trails. I can imagine that this is probably going to be one of the ones that I'm probably going to make into an official trail just because it talks about Vincent's Brigade, which we're going to be talking about here. And you can go all the way over to the 16th Michigan Monument from here. So this is one of those social trails that I think will stick around after the rehabilitation project. All right, so the most famous brigade that comes up here, the most famous unit, thanks to the movie Gettysburg and Killer Angels, is the 20th Maine. Yeah, you will know that story. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. But Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain would not have been up here without the actions of Colonel Strong Vincent, his brigade commander. Colonel Strong Vincent is from Erie, Pennsylvania. He graduated from Harvard and Trinity College and was practicing law in 1859 before the war. Vincent will become the first lieutenant colonel of the 83rd Pennsylvania. The 83rd Pennsylvania will be involved in many of the early fights of the Eastern Theater, specifically the Seven Days Battle, all the way up through Gettysburg. So this is a veteran command, and he has experience. Its colonel would basically leave the red, would be killed, I'd say leave the regiment. <laughs> yes, he would be killed at Gaines Mill uh, in the, the Seven Days Battles, almost just over a year previous to the Battle of Gettysburg. And that's going to elevate Strong Vincent to the command of the 83rd Pennsylvania. In May, the brigade commander of this brigade is going to resign because he of ill health and battle wounds and things like that. He's, he's going to depart and that's going to elevate Vincent up to brigade command being the senior colonel. Strong Vincent is only 26 years old, but by this point, he's an experienced combat commander. He's coming up with the rest of the 5th Corps as well, that 1st Division of the 5th Corps. The other two brigades, sorry, the other two brigades are going to go into the Wheatfield fight. Why he doesn't follow them is because one of those orderlies that Warren sends out is going to find 5th Corps and 5th Corps is going to send an orderly out to contact Barnes, commander of that 1st Division of the 5th Corps, to send a command up here to occupy Little Round Top. Vincent is going to intercept that orderly that is being sent to Barnes and ask him, what are your orders? Where are you going? This orderly quite rightly balks initially at this too, because again, this is Vincent, a random colonel. He needs to go talk to Barnes. Eventually, the order is going to give up the information and say, I'm supposed to find General Barnes to ask him for a brigade to come up here. Vincent is going to say, I'll take responsibility and go there myself. I'm from Barnes Division. So he's going to pull himself out and send himself up here with his men. How he decides to align himself is a fascinating thing. The 83rd Pennsylvania, which you see their monument down here, and you see that soldier on top? That's a soldier. That's not Strong Vincent. That's a soldier that strongly resembles Strong Vincent. Because the Pennsylvania rules for placing monuments said that you couldn't put an officer of colonel or whatever rank on the monument for Pennsylvania monuments. That included even ones who would fall during the battle. So, the veterans got around that and said, this is a soldier that looks 
like Strong Vincent. Nowhere is it mentioned on the monument that it is Strong Vincent. So that's how they got around. Anyway, the reason why they put that rule in effect for the Pennsylvania monuments 20 or so years afterwards is because these guys who were colonels or officers in those regiments are now running for office. So you don't want to take political side, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to glorify a particular candidate. So they're kind of kind of nipping that there and going, no, dude, we're not doing this. So, but Vincent had been killed at Gettysburg, you know, mortally wounded. But even so, that fell under that rule. So that's how the veterans got around. Anyway, a little side note there. The 83rd Pennsylvania request and the 44th New York behind you, that castle monument, they request to fight alongside each other. Ever since this brigade was formed early in the war, they have fought next to each other on multiple battlefields. And here they request to fight next to each other as well. Vincent, having been in the 83rd Pennsylvania, will grant that request. But it's also a smart move because these two are among the more experienced and hard fighting commands in his brigade. You want them forming the center of your line. Initially, he was going to place the 20th Maine on the right and the 16th Michigan on the left. But he's eventually going to flip-flop those. He's going to send the 16th Michigan down that way and send the 20th Maine over there. The 20th Maine, we're going to talk about what he says to Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain later. But something that you have to understand about what Vincent's doing here. He's arriving here with very little time. But in that little time, he is actually being instructive to his regimental commanders. He is going to basically tell them what he expects of them. He's going to meet with them. And we're going to see that with Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Chamberlain being the least experienced of the regimental commanders, Vincent spends a little more time with him. Because, again, this is going to be the least experienced. The rest of these, the 16th Michigan on over, have experience in battle and are under experienced commanders, especially James Rice of the 44th New York. So they arrive here at the southern end of Little Round Top on this spur that we name for Vincent now. And why do you think he's doing that? Because the attack has been consistently swinging in from the south. If the attacks continue to progress as they have, the Confederates are more than likely going to hit here. You wouldn't want to place yourself on the open face of Little Round Top, partially because there's still Union forces fighting in the Valley of Death and the Wheatfield. And the Confederates aren't going to go all the way around and hit it from the east. So the Confederates are going to more than likely come this direction. Within 15 minutes or so, and time's a little changed because they're not actually having a stopwatch going, hey, this is what's happening. Within 15 minutes, they think, some estimates. Off of Big Round Top, which the tree line was probably maybe, according to Gary Edelman of the American Battlefield Trust and other historians, they think, based on photographic evidence, the tree line was probably 80 or so yards distant from where it is, where that Warren Avenue is. It's probably a little bit hmm. further beyond, down here at least down over on this side but coming out of from off a of big round top in front of us would be sharpshooters u.s sharpshooters coming our direction a captain in the 83rd pennsylvania is going to yell at them where what are you running from you're running from nothing where are you going basically berating them they more or less give him a, a gesture that's not all that friendly and they keep moving because sure enough right on their heels is the fourth alabama of law's brigade the confederates are, have arrived so let's go talk about the attack on the rest of the line that's not the 20th maine oh i'm finny Again, where we're standing here is on the southern spur of Little Round Top. If you look over here and swing and pan around, you're going to see the fields of most of the second day's fighting. 
Uh, the Snyder Farm is in the distance. You have Hawks Ridge there in front of us with Devil's Den, which is going under rehabilitation efforts. Just beyond Hawks Ridge it would have been, is the triangular field. So you're seeing a lot of this. This is a great place to really assess and judge this side of the battlefield. As Gary Edelman puts forward and as other historians put forward, we, they think based on photographic evidence that that tree line right there was probably more like 80 yards distance. Okay, so it's probably not, or 80 or so yards. I mean, I may be wrong about that figure, but it wasn't up at the road. It was further back. Okay, so give you some kind of idea. The other thing about standing up here besides the tour roads that weren't here at the time is this rock wall as well. No, Vincent's Brigade didn't come up here and conveniently find a rock wall from which to hide behind and fire. No, this was, these were breastworks that were built on the night of July 2nd into July 3rd. So they weren't here. They didn't have the time to build breastworks. They got here and were almost immediately attacked. Forming the right flank of Vincent's line was the 16th Michigan. Their left flank marker is right there. Their right flank marker, and just because I don't want to tear myself up, is going to be more over here in the tall grass. They're occupying here. The 16th Michigan is a veteran command. They've been in many a hard fight to this point in the conflict. One of their more tough days was the Battle of Gaines Mill, where they occupied the portion of the line where John Bell Hood's brigade came through the Texas Brigade piercing that line and being decisive in the battle. There, dozens of their comrades as well as their commander would be captured. As would have it, who's attacking them on this day is the 4th and 5th Texas of the Texas Brigade. Those same regiments that had pierced that line not over a year previously. So the 16th Michigan is here, and they're a veteran command, a hard-fighting command. And I preface what I'm going to say by saying that, because oftentimes what happens at Gettysburg comes to define you for the rest of basically your legacy. It becomes your legacy. And these guys here at Gettysburg might have had a black mark on their record if it weren't for Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain writing as much as he did and speaking as much as he did. And then we remember that instead of this. The 16th Michigan is up here. And due to the nature of the ground down there, the Texans will try to initially form a battle line. But they can't because there are the strewn, the ground is strewn with boulders. And so it's very difficult to form a line of battle, shoulder to shoulder, moving through the field. They're going to try that initially and be repulsed. Then the Texans will reform and will attack Indian style, meaning by squads moving rock to rock. The 16th Michigan is by all means repelling all these attacks. They're not having a problem. And then inexplicably, the flag of the 16th Michigan goes back up the hill. A junior officer took it upon himself to give the order to send the flag up the hill, or to send the flag up the hill himself. We're not quite sure, altogether sure, positive, or at least I'm not, about the efficacy of the story, but there, there was maybe a misheard order or a misunderstanding. And so the 16th Michigan, like any good regiment in the Civil War does, where your flag goes, that's where you go. They're not doing this because they're cowards. They're not doing this because they're afraid. They're doing this because their flag is going back that direction. Because that's what you do. The problem is now Vincent's right flank has opened the door for the Texans to come up here on the shelf. <laughs> on the spur. Vincent might have had time to be concerned about the 20th Maine and the inexperience of that commander over there. But what's going to give him the most trouble is this one simple mistake. 
but one simple mistake can define battles. Except for Patrick O'Rourke arrives. The 140th New York has finally arrived and they're going to charge down the hill, basically charge into essentially the Texans as they're up here and drive the Texans back off the shelf. That's about it. That's it for the Texans. They're more or less done after that. Okay? So the 140th New York saves the day. But in the process, Patrick O'Rourke is killed. And when is Vincent uh, mortally wounded? When the 16th Michigan moves back, Vincent, either up there on that rock, or over here where his plinth is, depending on where you decide to go, is going to stand up on a rock with his riding crop and is going to say, don't give an inch. And he's going to look towards and see what's going on. And in the process of when he's doing that, a bullet's going to enter his thigh into his groin and he's going to be mortally wounded and carried off to a nearby farm. So once the 16th Michigan starts moving back, he's going to, this is when he's going to look up and see what's going on and that's when he gets nailed. So then O'Rourke comes over with 140th New York, drives the Texans off the spur, and then stabilizes Vincent's line. For me, this is going to be an interesting thing about the Confederate attack because this ends the Confederate attack here on this side. There are no other Confederate soldiers coming behind them. Hmm. This is it. The Texans of Robertson's brigade, who due to a mix up when they were coming across the field, attached themselves to Law's brigade, are attacking. And, and of course, 4th Alabama, and we'll talk about the 47th and 15th Alabama a little bit later, but that's it. Maybe the 44th Alabama down here, maybe 48th Alabama a little bit too. But that's it, there's nobody behind them. So once this attack is done of the Texans, that's it for the Confederates on this side. And these Texans, don't, don't give them any short shrift. They were actually quite an experienced and probably some of the best combat soldiers in Lee's army. If anyone was going to take this hill, it's them. And they almost did. But if it weren't for the 140th New York. The Battle of Little Round Top is defined by chance meetings done at the right moment, or chance moments that happen at the right moment for the Union. Governor Warren being sent up here and looking at exactly the right time to see the Confederate attack develop. Governor Warren finding Patrick O'Rourke, a commander from a brigade he commanded and there's a the trust there between them to pull Patrick O'Rourke up here. Vincent intercepting a courier down there and coming up here with his brigade 15 or so minutes before the Confederates attack. And finally, that 140th New York coming, it might as well be the nickname for July 2nd for the Union, New Yorkers coming out of nowhere. Because here comes the 140th New York to save the day on the right flank of Vincent's line. <laughs> Interesting. Minutes can mean the difference in a battle like this. And those crucial minutes were in the favor of the Union on that day. <laughs>